and I'm Christy Keith, and I'm a senior communication strategist for Fear Free. And I'm we're so grateful that uh, nearly 200 of you are here today to uh, to join us on your morning or your lunch hour, depending on where you're uh, calling in from. Uh, we are very lucky to have a great presentation and a great presenter here today. But before we introduce Dr. Radosta and get started, I wanted to make a couple of housekeeping announcements. This presentation does qualify for race CE for veterinarians and veterinary technicians. I have to be very, very clear on how that works because the last time we did this, there were a lot of questions. At the end of this presentation, and only at the end, I am going to post the link to the CE into the uh, chat window. You may be automatically taken to the survey at the end of the webinar, or you may not. Some people's browsers do not allow uh, forwarded <coughs> forwarding. Excuse me, <coughs> I have a cold. <laughs> I can't lie. Um, don't allow forwarding. In that case, you're going to need to click on the link that's in the chat window. If you have, if you are not taken to or able to click on the link, you can email me at fearfreepets@gmail.com. Do not use the website contact form. Do not use the WAGs at fearfreepets.com. Email me directly, fearfreepets at gmail.com, and I will send you the link to the survey. You need to answer just a few simple questions. And then, unlike last time, you will be taken, given the opportunity to download your certificate uh, online. You will be able to print it and fill it out with your name. And we will also be sending the record of your um, completion of the survey to RACE. Uh, this is slightly different from how the CE works on our podcasts and uh, some of our other CE opportunities. So we just wanted to be very, very clear. If you are watching this in the recorded version, you will not be able to get CE for this presentation. It's only available for the live webinar. Additionally, it will be closed down at the end of the day on Monday, so please go ahead and answer the questions immediately because after this is closed down, you will also not no longer be able to get CE for this presentation. Sorry that it's a little complicated, but um, this is, was actually set up by our wonderful sponsors at Zoetis on very short notice, and uh, we're just grateful that they were able to make this available to you today. So um, additionally, you can ask questions of Dr. Radosta. She will answer some of them at the end of the presentation. Please just type them into the chat window as uh, they come to you, uh, and I will be collecting them and presenting them to Dr. Radosta when she's done. We are going to wrap up pretty close to on the hour, um, hopefully. So uh, we won't be able to answer a lot of questions, but please don't hesitate to put them into the chat window. And of course, if you're having any trouble with the, with the event itself, uh, go ahead and type those into the chat window too. Anyway, let me introduce uh, the wonderful Dr. Radosta to you. Uh, Lisa Radosta is a board certified veterinary behaviorist. She graduated from the University of Florida College of Veterinary Medicine. And uh, she completed a three-year residency in behavioral medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and uh, received the Resident Research Award from the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists two years in a row. Uh, she has owned Florida Veterinary Behavior Service since 2007. She lectures nationally and internationally for veterinary professionals and pet owners. She's written book chapters for textbooks, including Handbook of Behavior Problems of the Dog and Cat, Blackwell's Five-Minute Veterinary Consult, Canine and Feline and Small Animal Pediatrics, in addition, she's published scientific research articles in the Applied Animal Behavior Science Veterinary Journal and has numerous other uh, publications to her credit. And she co-authored From Fearful to Fear Free, a positive program to free your dog from anxiety, fears, and phobias with Fear Free founder Dr. Marty Becker, Mikkel Becker, and uh, Dr. Weilani Sung. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Renosta. Please take it away. Thank you. I am so excited to talk to you guys today. It is a beautiful day in Southeast Florida. We've hit our low for the winter. We're down to 60. So I get to wear long pants today. I'm extremely excited and uh, like a sweat jacket. 
So we break out our boots if we get below 60 around here. So we're excited, but I'm going to talk to you today about noise aversion outside of what we generally get presented with as veterinarians, which is thunder and fireworks. So what we hear from clients sometimes, right, is that my dog's afraid of thunderstorms or I need some drugs for the 4th of July. Like those are common. What we may not be presented with is that daily noise aversion, but what we get is the end result. So my dog won't walk outside during the day. Very, very often that is from a noise aversion that has been, been endured chronically by the dog causing a chronic stress response, causing a generalized anxiety or phobia. Extremely common. My dog runs out of the kitchen when I use the microwave. It's not bothersome, and to some clients it may even be humorous, unfortunately, at first. But when that blows up into my dog will not enter the living area when I'm cooking, it's presented to you as a problem. So I just want to bring those things to your attention with this lecture so you know how to search for those things in the history. These, obviously, these behavior disorders affect the patient's well-being and, of course, the bond with the owner. I'm I'm surprised. I have an acre and a quarter, so I put my dog in the backyard. I don't walk him, but I am surprised by how many people have property and have a backyard and really value the walk. I'm just surprised because it's not something within the scope of what I value. I'm happy to watch Maverick run around the yard and dig holes and swim in the pool. But when they can't walk with their dog, it's a big deal. And it affects the bond they have with them and the enjoyment they get from their pet. And it affects the client's well-being because they don't exercise. Many clients have come to me and said, if I don't walk this dog, I'm not going to get up and do anything. So there's a whole world around noise aversion that compromises the pet's quality of life and the owner's well-being, physical health, and quality of life. Things like what you see on your screen now, big trucks like you see on the left, motorcycles, uh, skateboards, bicycles, cars that backfire, doors slamming to cars, any of these things can become things that scare the dog. Inside of the house, there's your microwave. Now, if you're like me, the microwave is your primary cooking tool, except for, of course, your cell phone, so you can call and get food delivered. But if you can't use your microwave because it scares your dog, you know, a big part of your ability to make your meals, if you're like me, I guess, is gone. Also, the sounds that come from the cell phone. So I have this precious little Shih Tzu patient. He is the cutest ever, the softest fur you could possibly imagine. And his mom is wonderful. And her house cleaner comes to the house, the person who takes care of cleaning the house, and has a cell phone. And it makes a sound that scares this little guy, scares him to death. And now when the house cleaner comes over, he hides. And he doesn't just hide while she's there. He hides after she's there. So this is really affecting his ability to have a happy life. And what happened to this little guy and what will happen to your patients is that they'll go through this process called generalization. And whenever I talk to you guys, I want to talk to you about, hey, this is the, this is the uh, scientific definition of this word, but here's the reality of this word. So if we're looking at the science of learning, generalization is the transfer of a learned response from one stimulus to another stimulus. What is that really? What I tell clients is, That is actually where the dog believes in general he will experience something scary when a stimulus is present. So my little Shih Tzu patient, we're just going to call him Fido. Okay, so Fido was afraid of that cell phone sound, and he associated it with the woman who carried the cell phone. Well, that's reasonable. Now, whomever comes to clean the house, whether it's that woman or another woman, or a man, if there's someone that uses a cleaning tool, he runs and hides. So in general, he believes that the things associated with that woman, what she did in the house, are scary, and that he should run and hide to protect himself. So we don't want generalization. That's bad juju, right? Thumbs down. Next, how would you use, as a doctor, how are you going to use 
a medication to help with an intermittent problem, okay, or a problem you may not be able to get ahead of. Because whether you've been to my lecture or any lecture by any veterinary behaviorist ever, we are always preaching, you got to get ahead of the stress response. Why are you giving those medications that you're giving for fear, anxiety, and stress once the animal's already stressed? Right? So we've taught you that for decades, and that's true. But how can you use a medication if the animal's kind of in the stress response or you can't always predict it? And that is where you are going to want a medication that works quickly. So one way to use a medication like Cilio, one that works fast for an intermittent noise aversion, is to use it just before you think that event is going to happen. And we're having a little freeze up with my computer and I'm trying to be patient. You guys should be able to see my cursor and the spinning wheel of death on my computer. So I'm gonna keep talking to you because I know what's on this slide and we'll see. If I can't get it to work, it's not a problem. I'll fix it. Um, so number one, if you can predict, hey, I cook dinner at five o'clock each night, one of the things you can do is premedicate for that event. I'm just gonna escape out of this attempt to and try to get our picture back here. The number two way, another thing that you can do is to, here we go, is to give that, hey, there we are, there we go, is to give that medication during the event if it takes longer than 30 minutes for the dog to recover. Okay, so why is that? Because Cilio is gonna take somewhere around 20 to 30 minutes to really get in there and start working, maybe 40, but in my clinical experience, we're really at 20 to 30. So if, for example, my little Shih Tzu patient, right, house cleaner comes, I would prefer that the owner pre-dose the cilio for those events. That would be my preference. What if she, I don't know, she couldn't be there. She got held up. She can still, for this particular guy, dose with cilio during the event because we know his recovery is quite long. And number three, we know the event is going to last longer than it takes for the medication to work. Now, is that a good thing to do, to dose during the event? No, but sometimes we have to make do with what we have. Sometimes we have to make a meal out of what we have in the refrigerator, right, which is what we're doing. This is what I call the common sense slide. Zoetis calls it the legal slide. It reminds you in very small print, don't be silly. Don't give cilio to dogs who have severe cardiovascular disease, who are decrepit and very old, or who are pregnant or lactating or meant for breeding, you guys should read about, and you've heard me say this before if you come to any of my lectures anyway, you really do have to read about the drugs you're using so you know them well enough that you can take responsibility for that prescription. So one of the things that we are going to do is we are going to look at a couple of videos in a second that are going to show you what uh, cilio, what the effect of cilio is on a patient. Because one of the biggest challenges I think that I have when talking to practitioners about this medication, and once again, we're having some strange glitch, so you guys will see the screen change and then change back, um, is that I don't think that the many of the practitioners that I talk to understand what they should expect from cilio. What you should expect is that the, what I want you to know is that the outcome for cilio is calm, ambulatory, can move. This is not acepromazine, okay? Able to learn and respond to cues. So at the prescribed dose, if you go by the label, that is generally what you're going to see. So keep that in your mind because, and I'm gonna pull up the videos that I wanna show you right now. Um, you'll, if you've heard me lecture or if you are, um, if you, you know, are one of my residents is here or someone that I've taught, then you know that I always say when you choose your med, choose your outcome first. Choose what you want to have happen first. So we have to remind ourselves of this outcome, okay? There it is again, calm, ambulatory, able to learn and respond to cues, okay? Everyone should be seeing a video right now with chenille and purple scrubs and a little papillon in front of you. Christy, do you see that? So what I'll do is I'll show you this video and I'll tell you why I'm showing it. I have successive videos of this little guy 
on Cilio. Sometimes owners are afraid to dose things at home. Sometimes they don't have the time to work out the medication dosing. So we are happy to keep a patient in the clinic for the day. We don't keep them overnight. I have done that, but we usually don't. And to work out the medication. So this is my little patient with no meds on board. And what I want you to see is his, you know, spunk and how happy he is and how responsive he is. And then I'll show you the videos uh, post cilio administration. Okay, so I'm going to pull up the next video. There's always a delay between me and you, okay? So in a minute, you're going to see a video pop up where you see the corner of a cage. So what I wanted you to see from that last video was he's alert. He bopping around like a papillon should be, learning something, listening to his mom, okay? Now, this first video that you're going to see is an hour after administration. I think it's an hour and 15 minutes to be exact. After administration, okay? And what you should see is that he's a little less spunky. That spunk is just not quite there. You see his eyes, you'll see, are just a little bit droopy, and his little ears are droopy, and he's just not spunky. When he sits back, his ears go sideways a little bit, and his eyes want to hang a little bit, okay? He's not zonked out, but he's tired, and he'd rather sleep. So now I'm going to exit out of that video, and we're going to bring up the next video, okay? And we're going to give you guys a second to kind of catch up with me a little bit because we're a little bit behind each other. This next video is at closer to two hours. Okay, and you guys know from reading the label that you are permitted to, or it's recommended that you could, administer Cilio every two hours. You're going to see again now a little bit sleepier dog than you did before. All right, we're around two hours, guys, okay? His ears are droopier. His eyes are droopier. He really would rather kind of just lie down, but because one of the CCRs is talking to him, getting this video for me, uh, he's sitting up. But you could see he sort of looks like, oh, I'm exhausted today. I could really take a nap. Now we're going to watch a three-hour video. I want you to see the difference in this little guy once it's been three hours since we've given the cilio. Because by now, you are going to start to see your patient's personality come back. So now you should be seeing my little cutie patootie sitting there in a cage. Uh, he is pretty bright and alert by three hours post-administration. So we're going to click play. And hopefully you're going to see that clearly. Okay, tail wag. CCR's talking to him. He's like, oh, oh, my God, I'm so excited to see you. Are you going to take me out of here? What are you doing? I'm just sitting in this cage. He's being his happy, pap self. So you've seen kind of the whole thing. You've seen the before. You've seen about an hour, about, a two, about two hours. And now about three hours, that label dose, the label dose has worn off. All right, now we're going to go back to our slideshow. And if I have problems with it, I'll just exit out of it and show it to you this way. We'll get it done. So let's go ahead and play from the current slide. Let's go through a case. This is Micah. Micah is a four-and-a-half-year-old, 32-kilo, mixed-breed dog, male, neutered. And he comes to me, he's referred to me, because he's afraid to go outside. He just refuses to walk, 
doesn't want to go potty. You know, I saw a patient, now she just had her three-month recheck. So it must have been maybe three and a half or four months ago. She would hold her urine and feces for 36 hours because she was afraid to go outside. It was all noise aversion, all of it. So this is, in my world at least, a really common problem, a common reason for referral. So, okay, uh, his presenting complaint we talked about. Oh, guys, okay, not a big deal. I'm not going to worry about this. I'm just going to reopen this um, presentation. So the back to Micah right here, and I'm going to stay, I think, here for a second instead of going into the presentation to see if we can get keep ourselves from getting kicked out. It's really important when you look at um, behavior disorders that you're taking some note of what the dog looks like, what his clinical signs are. That will help you immensely to be able to choose your medication and choose your behavioral treatments. So he's hypervigilant, tucked tail. He stops himself at the door or will stop himself during the walk. And if he becomes scared, and by this point, for this dog and for many others, at this point, the dog is not hearing anything in the environment that's scaring him. He's refusing to go outside. Owners say, I don't know what it is. I'm walking along. His tail goes down. He pulls me home. So it looks very vague, like what in the world could this be? Okay. Uh, and that's what's happening with him. If he um, is inside the house, He's quite happy. He's quite a normal dog inside the house. So we diagnosed him with noise aversion after some digging, which we don't have time to go into today. But after some digging, we got diagnosed with noise aversion and a generalized anxiety. First, we always institute management. A1, number one thing you must do. And I'll talk to you about how to do these things. You create a sanctuary room, a place where the dog can go to get away. Everybody needs one of these. You need one, I need one, dogs need one too. And we told the client to stop walking her dog except to go potty, and he was going to go potty in the backyard. She had enough slivers of grass around her pool that she could do that. This is extremely important, and you may get a ton of pushback when uh, you say stop walking your dog. Or if they live in a condo, walk him outside to go potty, bring him inside, and then exercise inside. Here's the concept, guys. It's the same concept as when you have a patient who has an injury. You have a dog come in lame. You don't say, oh, would you please jog with your dog five miles every day? And he'll be fixed. No. You say rest, 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 rest. May say great rest, depending on what you find. You must rest the brain and you must rest the stress response system. Or you're going to use a ton more medication than you ever wanted to. They have got to take at least a two-week break. Okay, so the behavioral treatments I asked her to do, I'm going to show you videos of these, so no worries, we're just going over them. Counter conditioning on walks, that is pairing something good with something bad in an effort to change the dog's emotional state. A relaxation exercise, I think everybody needs these. I, I really need one of these. Uh, passive attention, which I'll show you a video of. We're going to separate the walks into working walks and elimination walks. Elimination happens outside. Why? It, outside in the backyard. Why is that? Why would I do that? Because, here's why. Because I need those walks, quote unquote, quote, to be really safe. Because if the dog feels unsafe during elimination, what I could inadvert inadvertently create is a dog who eliminates in the house. That's not cool to have a dog this size urinating and defecating in the house. So you've got to create a scenario where the dog is safe. Sometimes I'll do it like one of those uh, pet potty things out on the lanai or the porch just so I can de-stress the dog. So there's a potty walk which occurs in the backyard. Then there is a working walk which might be two minutes long. I don't know how long it's going to be. But it's going to be as short, let's put it that way, as it needs to be for the dog to show improvement. Okay. Now, when you counter condition on walks, this is the working walk, and when you counter condition on walks, you are rewarding the dog every X, X is our variable, number of steps. It might be three steps, five steps, 10 steps. 
So here's the process. Get your pencils out because I don't have this written down anywhere in the, in the um, presentation. I go out with Micah. I reward him at, before the threshold of the door because he's hypervigilant when he goes outside. That means he's already mounted a stress response and he's anxious. So I'm going to get ahead of that. I give him a reward, a reinforcer. I take three steps, reinforce, three steps, reinforce. That's my whole walk. I slowly over time separately build the entire time for the walk, the entire duration of the walk. And I separately, I mean separate walks, I'm going to build more time between my reinforcers. Okay? That's step one. There are many more steps, but that alone counter conditions the dog to the environment of being outside and lowers stress. Okay, we needed a base medication. Why? Because this dog could be stressed at any moment that the owner took the dog outside. That's number one. Number two, this owner expressed that she would find it difficult to, um, to always manage pre-medicating for every single time he might have to go outside. So what we decided to do is work up to 60 milligrams. So we're like one and three quarters mg per kilo, let's say, once a day. We worked up to that over a year. So please do not put a 37 kilo dog on 60 milligrams of fluoxetine. You'll drop his appetite and he'll sleep all day. So uh, we worked up to that. And then we needed something for those working walks because what we were finding is that the fluoxetine allowed him to go in the backyard and go potty and allowed the walks to be better, but there would be a point where he'd tap out on those walks and we just couldn't get farther with our behavioral treatments. That's where we added in the Cilio, five dots, which is labeled dose, 30 minutes prior to walks. It was enough that he could uh, learn, enough that he could learn on that walk and take a normal walk, okay? So now let's look at this, the videos of the three things I told you I would teach you. Number one is relaxation. Relaxation is a, you know, it is a behavior that takes six weeks for the average owner to teach, even with good coaching from a really qualified, humane, positive reinforcement trainer or a fantastic behavior technician. It's going to take four to six weeks the end result is a dog who sees something physical, so in our case we have owners use a bath mat or something like that, a yoga mat, who sees the physical thing and their body has a response where it calms itself down. And I know some of you are thinking, come on, that's impossible. But this happens to you every day of your life. I can name two things right off the bat, sitting on a cold day, with a warm ceramic mug of coffee and I hold it with both hands and I feel, I don't know, it's a completely different feeling back to the days when I lived in Pennsylvania and when I put on a hydration vest, it's a running vest for distance runners, when I put that on, I feel completely different. This happens to you all during the day in your life as well. So let's take a look at, at the way you get a dog to relax. This is quite a long video but I want you to see everything, and it has instructions in it as well. There's no sound, so you'll hear my voice talking to you. And what you'll see um, is instructions first, of course. So we tell people, we need a mat big enough for your dog's entire body. The mat only comes out when you're working, okay? And you may not engage your dog, not overly engage your dog, while they're on the mat. These are super important steps, y'all. Okay, so number one, the first goal we have, the first benchmark, is to get a dog to want to go to the mat as soon as it's put down without coaxing. Okay, so there's no, um, come on, please come to the mat, go to your mat, you lie down. None of that happens. We condition the dog to want to be on the mat. And you'll see with Liam, he's ready, right? Boom, give me that mat. So once he's on the mat and he loves it, we're going to move to stage two. Stage two, or stage two benchmark, or stage two goal, is to get one minute, 60 seconds, of dog lying on mat. And again, we're not barking cues here. You stay, stay. No, we're not saying anything. You make a choice to go to this mat. We start out rewarding very frequently, every one to two seconds. And then, when we feel like the dog's really getting there, 
we're going to reward or reinforce, rather, is a better term, every five seconds, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, build duration on this mat. And I have taken a six-week exercise and made it into like three minutes, but you get the idea. You'll notice that Kayla's body is oriented away from her dog. And she's not being lazy on her cell phone. She is disengaging from the dog by doing something else. Moving on to stage three, Kayla has now created a dog who could stay on this mat for three or four or five or ten minutes with a pretty low reinforcement rate. That means getting reinforcers fairly infrequently. Okay? Now she changes the criteria and she only reinforces her dog, so puts a treat on the mat only when the dog looks relaxed to her. It requires a little peripheral vision going there. But she's doing a fantastic job of disengaging from the dog and still reinforcing at the right time. Your clients aren't Kayla. She's way skilled. She's a vet tech. She's a KPA. Um, but they can get this done with the coaching of people like Kayla. And then we're going to move on to stage four, where she feels like she's getting from Liam uh, a really great response of offering those body language cues. She's going to now make him wait to get the reinforcer. So when I say reinforcer, I'm talking about the food that's put on the mat. She's going to wait. She's going to make him wait to get that reinforcer until he's held that body language, head down, deep breaths, closed eyes, whatever it is, for first one second, then two seconds, then three seconds. And she's going to slowly increase the, the duration, the time. Duration is a training word, the time between those reinforcers. The end result is pretty cool, if I may say so myself, and it is the dog being completely relaxed within a couple of minutes of when you put the mat down and eventually falling asleep. So what is the point of this? And you'll see this on the video in a minute. What's the point of doing all of this work? Because now we have a way to calm the dog down without drugs. Isn't that precious? He's so precious. Um, so that's a big deal, to have a way to calm anybody, my daughter, myself, my dog, without a drug. It's, this is mega, super duper powerful, y'all, okay? Now, we talked about rewarding or reinforcing a dog every three steps, five steps, ten steps. Remember that? I told you guys the working walk, the backyard walk. And you are going to be reinforcing that dog X number of steps, right? But you've got to make that turn into something more or your clients will always be counting their steps on walks. And frankly, clients, at least in Southeast Florida, they're not so tolerant of all of that. So we're going to turn that into a passive attention exercise. So once you have given your, uh, once your patient is able to walk a reasonable distance, uh, getting the treats, like every six, seven, or eight steps, what you will start to see is the dog will start to look back at the owner. The owner's not cueing it. She's not asking for it. He's just cruising along, and he just checks in with her, like, hey, did you forget to give me a treat now? When the dog does that, the owner, the handler, the pet parent, right, is obligated to reinforce, to give food at that moment. If she does that enough, she will get a lot of checking in. And we're going to take that and turn it into an exercise where when the dog is frightened, he checks in with mom instead of pulling her back to the house. Okay, now we're going to watch a video. Again, you don't have to worry about sound. This is a seminar that I did. There's that big, scary Rottweiler. And then you see this little guy here who is scared of that big, scary Rottweiler. And every time he looks at his mom, she's going to reinforce him. Sometimes she's a little slow. But we want her to reinforce every single time he looks at her. We work up to every time that, that, that he looks at that Rottweiler, who to him is big and scary, to me is cuddly, but to him is big and scary, and looks back at his mother. See her reinforce? I did not. I was not at this seminar barking orders. We were letting this happen organically. And if you have a really great behavior tech or, or dog training professional to help you, this happens. So he went from being very scared of the big dog to looking at the big scary dog and looking back at his mama. 
fantastic. That can turn into a, an amazing tool. Now, this is counter conditioning, and then we're going to go on to a different case. This is counter conditioning. Counter conditioning is pairing something positive, food, toys, something, with something negative, motorcycles, trucks, in this case, it's other dogs or people, in an effort to change the dog's emotional state. This is a fantastic dog training professional, Mindy Cox, and her dog. And she, you'll see, is giving the food reinforcer quite frequently while the stimulus passes. That's pretty frequently that she's handing those reinforcers, right? She reloads in her pocket, in her treat pouch. And I don't know if you saw just then where the dog, her name is Bren, almost didn't want the treat. Mindy got that treat, that food reward right in her mouth, okay? So counter conditioning, pairing good with bad. Dog is not asked to do anything. The dog just has to be present in that moment. At least that's the way we just used it for Bren. So I'm going to continue to not be in presentation mode. I hope it doesn't bother you guys, but we've got kicked out several times, and I'm just worried about that. So it's not as pretty, but you are seeing everything that I would normally um, show you. So let's talk about Con, four-and-a-half-year-old, 16-kilo, male neutered Wheaton Terrier. He comes because he's afraid of the dishwasher and cell phone sounds, and he's also afraid of storms. When he is fearful, whether it be storms or thunder or whatever. He pants, he finds the owner. Um, when he, uh, he trembles. When the dishwasher goes on, he startles, like it shocks him. And when there's like a clunk, sometimes with my dishwasher, I mean, I know what the owner is talking about. When the water comes out, it's like a swoosh. Sometimes one of the big fan blades inside the dishwasher will hit a dish. He startles, okay? This is affecting the family's quality of life, for sure, because he didn't want to be with the family when that dishwasher was on. He wanted to be hiding. Okay. Uh, storm, fear, and noise aversion. So the first thing we did is we said, hey, management, we need a sanctuary room, which I will show you a little more about in a minute. Sanctuary rooms are designed to let the dog escape. We do not force the dog to go in. We don't close the dog in that room, and we also don't try to get him out of that room. It's his room. If he wants to, or his space, if he wants to be in there, so be it. That's his place to calm down. Uh, we put all the cell phones in the family on vibrate, of course, and we're going to run the dishwasher at the same time each day, which is going to be in the evening while he's out for a walk. So he's going out with dad. Mom's going to run the dishwasher. Okay, so we're going to de-stress him. This is the same concept as Micah, right? You've got to de-stress. So we're going to de-stress him. And then we're going to counter condition to the dishwasher, which you know what counter conditioning is. We just saw it with Bryn and we just discussed it, but we're going to do it just a little different way today with Con. We need a stabilization medication. And when I read this, when I made this lecture, I read it back to myself and I said, well, it looks like everybody in, in my world goes on Prozac and Cilio. That is not true. These two cases just happen to go on Prozac. And um, if you want to really know how we choose meds, the best thing to do is to come to one of my pharma lectures because uh, it's a little more complicated than this. But we definitely need a stabilization medication in this particular dog, and that was for the storms. Because from, from May to October here, it, it rains every day, storms every day. And then for the dishwasher, for the noise aversion, we're going to use the Cilio uh, three dots 30 minutes prior to dishwashing. Okay? Um, sanctuary room. A sanctuary room can be a room like you see on your left with a baby gate uh, up. It can be a room where uh, it's a closet. It could be a bathroom. It could be an office. It could not have a baby gate up, right? It could be a crate. There's my dog in a product called the Zen Crate. Uh, it happened to be in my office demonstrating it, and we took a picture of my cutie in there. It could be anything. The idea is that the dog should be able to get to it uh, with, of his own accord. When he needs to use it, we're going to prepare that room and make it as um, soundproof as possible. So interior rooms are lovely. Or putting crates in interior rooms, that would be ideal. We are going to um, then give him a calm toy in that space once a day, every single day, 
he's going to get a Kong toy in that space or any sort of food toy. I love Kongs, but it could be any food toy that works for that dog. So he gets conditioned to go into that room and to love that room well before I need him to love that room. We're going to use pheromones in that room for sure, plug them in either in the room or if it's a closet, it might be just outside the room because you usually don't have plugs in closets, not usually. Uh, and then we're going to turn on something to, t to, to drown out the sound of whatever that thing is. So that could be uh, white noise, brown noise. I prefer brown noise just to my ear. It's less sharp. Whatever works for the dog. I want to just tell you that music and the TV can't even come close to what white noise and brown noise can do when uh, soundproofing a room. It's not even, it's not even a competition. Because they'll say to you, oh, I put music on, oh, I have the TV. It's not the same. Because white noise is one sound all the time. No change in frequency, no change in intensity. Whereas with the TV, there might be a break between a television show and a commercial. Okay, well, during that moment, if the dog hears the scary thing like the dishwasher, we're done. So we want to make sure we're really making that soundproof. Next, um, counter conditioning. Now you see a picture of a dog with a Kong toy, but what I showed you before, the Border Collie, Bryn, with Mindy, right, is she was handing the food. This is an easy way to counter condition a dog. So every day when they uh, would start to turn that dishwasher on, when we got to the working part of this, we were out of that stress reduction phase, he would get uh, a Kong toy. This is not him, obviously. It's a different dog. He'd get a Kong toy stuffed with food way back in the sanctuary space. So he could hear the dishwasher, but not that well. And he had the food in the Kong toy. So we slowly would bring him closer and closer and bring him out into that space. Okay, so that's just like a smattering, really, of, of all the things you can do for dogs with noise aversion. I think it was a lot for 45 minutes, but hopefully you guys have generated some good questions that we can answer before we're done. This is Colleen, my friend Colleen's dog. He's very mischievous and he's eating our book, but it's a really, really good book. So uh, hopefully it'll be something you can recommend to your clients. He's so precious. This is my favorite picture of the book. It's so much better than any picture of any of us. So. All right, we are on to the thank you slide, which means we're ready for questions. And I want to, first of all, thank you guys for putting up with the technical difficulties we had today. Hopefully, you still got to see everything that you needed to see to have a good learning experience. And thank you, Zoetis, for making this happen. So back to you, Christy. <laughs> so uh, another question we got asked more than once was, can Cilio be used with other commonly used behavioral medications? Can Cilio be used with other commonly used behavioral medications? Yes. I avoid two, uh, I'm going to say psychiatric or behavioral meds with Cilio just for my own feeling of uh, comfort and uh, medically. I don't give clonidine and Cilio together and I don't give acepromazine and Cilio together. I don't think you probably have any adverse events at the oral doses that we use. I just avoid them. I have a lot of choices. I don't have to mix any two things that might cause hypotension or any two things that work in similar ways. Like I wouldn't combine Xanax and Valium either, right? So it's not that it might be a fatal interaction, it's that that isn't even a choice that I would want to make to combine two meds that do the same thing. So those are the only ones. Otherwise, everything else that I could tell you to use, you can combine with Cilio. Great, thank you. Um, you you answered this, but the question was actually asked in a, in a different part of your presentation after you had already addressed giving Cilio um, after the triggering event. This was a specific question about giving Cilio to a dog who is severely stressed, a dog who's really freaking out. Is that a good choice when you weren't able to get it in front of it? Um, so the question is, if the dog's really freaking out, is giving Cilio a good choice? This is, this is quite a general question. So, uh, so I'm going to give you, again, probably a longer answer than you really wanted. But so number one, it's always better to get ahead of the incident. 
if the incident is going to last longer than the 20 to 30 minutes it's going to take for Cilio to get in there and actually do something, then it might be helpful to you. If the, re if the recovery is going to take longer than 20 to 30 minutes, like if you know historically that dog takes a long time to recover, it may be helpful to you. You can expect that the effect of any medication that you give that is intended to affect stress, the effect of any of those medications that you give during a stress response, you can expect that that effect will be much, much lower. I mean 50-75%. So if you're trying to, to save an animal from a pure panic attack, give the meds. Do what you can to alleviate suffering. But know that, number one, that is not a good measure of what that medication would do if you gave it prior to. And also know that it's probably not going to do the trick for you. And you know this already. You knew the answer to this question because as a veterinary team member, you have many times, I would bet you many times, if you've been doing this for any amount of time, sedated animals who were stressed and looked at what you gave them and gone, how are you still walking? Like, I gave you what should have knocked out an elephant. And they're still not sedated enough for you to draw blood or give vaccines or whatever you're doing. And then they go home and the owner calls and she says, my dog's been sleeping for two days. What the heck did you guys do over there? So if that's ever happened to you, this is the exact same concept. Exact same concept. So yes, you can give it if the recovery is quite long or you think the event will be quite, quite long. You must understand that you will get a, a severely blunted outcome from administration of any psychiatric med in that way. Thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions, um, and a lot of them relate to how to do certain things. Um, I will send you all the questions, Dr. Radosta, in case you want to add anything to this, because we're going to run out of time, and there's no way we could get to them all. But I did want to ask two clarifying questions on your recommendations that should be fairly uh, straightforward. One of them was about the mat um, during the relaxation uh, set session. Uh, is the mat something that should be out all the time or uh, and always available, or are you, do you only bring it out when there is a potential for an aversive event? Right, so uh, the, the question is about the mat. So as you saw in those initial instructions when Kayla was working with Liam, the mat only comes out when you're working initially and is put away when you're not working. And that is because we want to condition a response to that mat. And if the mat's lying around all the time and it's in the environment, you're not going to condition that really strong, classically conditioned response. Uh, and, and so on, the reverse of that is the mat is not going to be left out in the house, but it is going to be brought out during aversive events. If you only bring it out during aversive events, you're risking that you are going to poison that. that it's not going to be a, a, a positive condition emotional response to the mat. So we have people still working. Even though the dog's been taught the exercise, they're still working. We have them work in their sanctuary space. And the mat is put out in the sanctuary space, not necessarily lying out in the house where the stimulus is going to be at full bore. Great, thank you. And then the other question was, uh, again, just a clarifying question. So you're saying the working walk is to focus on C, C, and D, and the elimination walk is just a quick go in the backyard to get busy and then right back inside. Right, and this, um, this should be, I would like you to think of this more broadly than these cases. I would like you to think of it as the dog has to de-stress, you have to rest the brain. How will you do that and still allow the dog to have a functional leaf? Okay, so if I apply that broad frame, then I can say I must have a way for the dog to eliminate. So when they go outside in the backyard, they eliminate and come back in. Every single walk is a working walk. Every time you go out the front door, the garage door, whatever leads out of the yard, that is for work. So what I'm trying to do is just what you would do. It's just like orthopedics really. It's just what you would do, right? So you're resting the dog. The dog has to go to potty, so you have to take the dog out in the backyard for the bathroom if you have like an orthopedic injury, let's say. And then you slowly through rehab going to bring that musculature back to where it needs to be to support a disease joint or whatever. And of course, I'm simplifying rehab. But 
that's the idea, is you are slowly bringing that muscle back, and you're doing that on these working walks. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we also had a lot of questions about unpredictable and intermittent noise aversion, and uh, we uh, further had a number of questions uh, of people asking about uh, what to do when the uh, reaction to the noise trigger lasts much, much longer than the noise. So, for example, a dog who is, you know, there's jackhammering outside and the jackhammering is done, but the dog is still completely stressed out for two hours afterward. Is that something where you'd continue dosing the cilio even though the noise trigger is over? Or would you be looking at some other intervention? Um, so the question is about dogs who have long recovery times where the stimulus has disappeared yes. or is gone and they have a long recovery. If I was in that moment, I could continue to dose cilio every two hours. Again, if, if I can frame this a little differently than how the question's asked, you as the practitioner, your job is to reduce and hopefully if you're really good and really lucky and you make good choices for your patients, eliminate stress. So if, if I can have you apply that to the way you treat your patients, you, again, already have the answer to your question, right? So I try to give you these broad statements that can help you work through things without, without my input. So what I would want you to do is think about that. Well, if I have a dog who's stressed for eight hours, my job is to eliminate, reduce or eliminate stress, I'm going to redose. Like to me, that's a very... I know my life is kind of black and white, which sometimes I get criticized for, but to me it's very black and white if the stress is still there. Now, but wait, if the owner says, oh, no, I'm in a new development, they're going to be building these houses for the next three years, and there's 200 houses in my development, am I going to dose a dog with cilio every two hours, 365? No. Well, first of all, I can't even do that. I can't dose it every two hours for more than five doses anyway. Besides, you're asking a lot of people, and people can't go to work if they're going to dose it like that. So if I know this is going to continue to happen, I am looking then for a longer-acting medication to use to cover my patient every day, all day. Great. We're not great. <laughs> Thank you for that valuable information. I feel bad saying great about poor suffering animals, but I'm so grateful that they have interventions that can help. And, uh, Dr. Vidosta, um the example that you worked with was a cell phone noise as a triggering event. And uh, the question asked was if, there, if you have any recommendations about decibel levels or pitch that can reduce or prevent reactivity to ringing or notification sounds. So I think what this person, I'm not totally clear exactly what's being asked. I think they're asking for a decibel limit. Is that what they're asking? How I think low? That I, I just, I, what it seems to me what the question is, is to know, is there, for example, can you choose a ringtone uh, or notification sound that's less likely to cause Oh, okay. Well, so, you know, the, the thing is, what so there isn't, I don't have anything that I can pull from literature and say dogs respond more negatively to a ding than to a pop song that you download because you can download songs. My, <laughs> right. my, yeah, my song, my ring for my phone is a Rolling Stone song, right? So okay. you can, you can choose anything. So I don't have a specific thing that I know from the literature, from experience that upsets dogs more than another thing. But this is what I can tell you in general. In general, things that come out of the blue and are sharp. Like okay. the ding, the ding of a text, or that funny kind of standard text sound that phones make, seem to upset dogs a lot more than the swish sound of like an email being sent. So sharp toned sounds that come out of the blue. So I would think about uh, taking out any sounds like sharp dings or things like that and think about sounds that wouldn't startle you, like a song or uh, Yoda is one of my ringtones. Uh, okay. And that, yep, so simple things like that. My husband uses the Darth Vader breathing, stuff like that that isn't sharp and won't um, ring loudly in the, in the dog's environment. Perfect. Thank you. 
So um, another question, uh, <clears throat> there was a fair number of questions about Cilio specifically. Um, one of them was, how is this for dogs who have seizure disorders? So the question is, can you give Cilio to a dog with a seizure disorder? Yeah. Well, so yes, but you, you can do that. The question is, it's always going to come back to for me. The question is going to come back to what outcome am I looking for? Right? And so, uh, if you have an acute problem, in a dog who also has a seizure disorder, would you be better off choosing a benzodiazepine would be the question. And because those are also anticonvulsants, so anxiolytics, they increase appetite, some relax musculature like diazepam. So that would be my first question to myself. Is there another medication class that would do the same job for me where I would have I, I had zero risk, right? And if not, you can get cilio to seizure patients, as long as they're well controlled with some other medication, you should be fine. Okay, great. So another question, I'll get a lot of questions about sanctuary rooms, and one of them was, do you have any recommendations for white noise or non-aversive long-lasting sound, such as through a dog's ear or a fan, or is it better to try and deprive them of auditory stimuli entirely? So the question is, what would be better, to deprive a dog of auditory stimuli entirely or to use something like white noise or classical music? So I was talking to a applied animal behaviorist who is world famous on the phone one day, who I respect greatly. And she's, and I can't remember, it's like a North Midwest state. And so what she did for her dog is she uh, has an, an, ig an igloo-style doghouse. I don't know if you guys know what those are. It's outside. Oh. And she puts the dog in that during storms. So she's not putting her dog in jeopardy. Lightning's not going to strike her dog. But my point is she can't – when I told her what we do here in Florida, putting on the white noise, <laughs> making it loud enough so that the dog doesn't hear anything – she was like, oh, my God, I could never do that to my particular dog because he would be overloaded. So I tell mm -hmm. that story because it's individual, not only to your patient, but uh, also to um, where you live, okay? So in Florida, this is what our storms look like. In Georgia, they're going to look this way too. Southeast, really. The this, this sky is blue and gorgeous. The dog gets no warning. The sky opens up. Literally, your windows shake, and then in 20 minutes, the sky is blue. And those dogs progress very fast into a really bad phobia. And for us to put a dog, for us to not, in this climate, for us to not drown out the storm, is a kiss of death. In Pennsylvania, the storms were entirely different. And so, number one, it's going to be individual to your patient. You're going to have to go with the flow. Number two, a fan, like a bathroom fan. But that's a great way to burn out your bathroom fan. That's happened to my clients. So, a bathroom fan, brown noise. There's an app that I have on my phone called White Noise, <laughs> really inventive name, and it has brown noise, pink noise, white noise, everything. Okay, so I, to my ear, I like brown noise. Um, and then... On the uh, on the other side of that, my, one of my clients turns her dryer on, and that's the only thing that will soothe Libby, her dog, during a thunderstorm. So individual, uh, white noise, the dryer, a fan is your best bet. You're trying to drown out noise. I don't know how you would keep the dog in a noise-free room without extra sound to drown out the noises unless you built a soundproof bunker. And I'm telling you, in 20 years, I've seen it all. I did have a client that did this. He built an air-controlled, so there was a vent and everything, bunker for the shepherd that we had had. We had, she was stable, but we had had a time stabilizing her. He built a soundproof bunker. She walked in on her own. When he closed it, you couldn't hear a darn thing, right? And he piped in this light reggae music, which is what she liked, because that's what he liked. And he had this, I don't, I'm not an engineer, but the airflow thing, like when you walk into a, a research building, right? So there was constant airflow, and he had a camera, and he sent me videos. During a thunderstorm, the dog is flat out of sleep. She is zonked. 
she's out. So I had one client in 20 years do that. Like, who can do that? What does that cost, by the way? (laughs) I have no idea. He was a handy guy, and it was plywood on the outside, and then he had that foamy stuff that you see at concert halls and stuff and radio stations. If you've ever been in a radio station, like, he knew his stuff. But that was a cure for that dog. That was a zero drug cure. But, you know, not. A, I've never had anybody else do that. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, no, I think it did. It answered it perfectly. And I myself looked into creating some kind of soundproof uh, booth for my uh, stormphobic dog as well and uh, kind of got to the, the point where I realized that in order to do this, it's going to cost about $60,000, and so I backed off. But uh, Yeah, holy cow, I, yeah. I think that's a great, a great experience for people who have that op- op- option. Um, so speaking of <clears throat> problems with um, lack of resources, the next question was, what thoughts or strategies do you have related to noise aversion treatment within a noisy animal shelter? Oh, the animal shelters, these, these, these people do such good work and they are under such um, restrictive conditions. You know, I, I am not, um, I don't personally work in shelters. However, there are several veterinary behaviorists that do that you can search on the Internet and contact to get the answer to that question because we need to reduce the barking because barking causes barking. And and I can pull from my brain, sure, we know that pheromones reduce barking. You can use pheromones. Yes, we know that playing classical music in only one study, in other studies this has shown not to be true, but in one study dogs barked less in a shelter. In In a thesis paper that was just published, I sent it to Fear Free Leadership not that long ago, showed that dogs barked more, vocalized more in the classical music room. So I don't know. That may help. But the people that I would look to for shelter work, there are some real leaders. Um, Sarah Bennett is at uh, North Carolina State University. She's a leader in shelter. Uh, Sheila Segerson is another leader. And, of course, the leader of all leaders is going to be my good friend Janine Berger at the San Francisco SPCA, and if you need to find good information on dog training stuff and cat enrichment, their website is also phenomenal. So if you are in a shelter, I want to send you to an expert, not just, quote, research that I know, someone who's on the ground doing it. And those three women, they know it all, man. So if you can find them on the Internet or contact them through their work or whatever, they're the people. Well, I will say that um, Dr. Bennett and uh, Sheila Sigerson is now Sheila Darpino. Uh, and oh, that's Dr. right. Yes, that's yes. right. When I was, was uh, I did my residency with her, she was and she was at a different <laughs> residency, but we were at the same time. Yes, yes. She's Darpino, and she's been Darpino for like a decade. For, I just, yeah, for like you know, now. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. But, uh, <laughs> um, Dr. Darpino can be reached through Maddie's Fund. Uh, and um, also uh, Dr. Darpino and Dr. Bennett are two of the uh, behaviorists working on the Fear Free uh, Certified Shelter Program, which will be uh, launching next year and will be free of charge to all people who work in shelters. So um, definitely there are more resources coming from those very people you've identified and also uh, with Dr. Brenda Griffin, who's spearheading that project for Fear Free. So thank you for that comprehensive um, response and recommendation to talk to experts. Um, We had a lot of questions about alternative medications, uh, quite a few, in fact, and people were asking some very general questions, like what about Trazodone, what about Buspirone, and what I wanted to kind of do was um, group them together and ask you uh, whether you're using Cilio or not, how do you see other medications that are commonly used, whether antidepressants, benzodiazepines, uh, you know, drugs like Buspirone, drugs like Trazodone, how does this all fit together for you in terms of specifically noise aversion? Uh, that's, the, you know, those are several, gosh, those are 20 questions in one. This is what I yeah. want people to take away. Noise aversion is just a fear or a phobia like anything else. Could be a fear of men, could be a fear of cars, right? So I, I'm going to generalize myself, like we talked about in the lecture. I'm going to lump into them into one group. And what I want you to start thinking about, if you really want to get your outcomes 
fantastic, and I don't care if you're using an herb or you're using an antidepressant or you're using cilio. Outcome first. What I see is that dog's anxious. What do I have on myself? Trazodone. Let me throw it at the dog. Well, that didn't work. What should I do now? Right? No. Look at your outcome. What do you want? Do you want a sedated dog? <laughs> Trazodone and acepromazine sedate. Do you want a dog who's hungrier and less anxious but not necessarily sedated? Benzodiazepine, gabapentin. Like, look at your outcome first. Then choose your medication second, okay? Once you have the list of medications, in the beginning, you're going to do this with a pencil and paper. Then you've got this list in front of you. Then you say, can we pre-medicate or does it have to be on board 24-7? Now you X out the ones that work, that take six weeks to work, right, if you don't need that 24-7 drug. So it's that kind of, that's the thought process I want you to go through. And if you do that, now I have an, I mean, I, I lecture for two hours on pharmacology, right? So mm -hmm. there's a lot more than that. But if you do that, your outcomes will be better, regardless of what drug you choose, because you'll be choosing the right drug for the right patient, you know? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, another drug question, this one is about Cilio. Is Cilio recommended in cases where dogs have a history of offering aggressive behavior in response to sound? So uh, the question of using Cilio in aggressive dogs, any medication that you can prescribe that will alter mood can cause aggression. And so because the dog might get agitated, it's much lower than you, you would think considering all the hype around using these meds that you, you hear a lot. And the dog's going to get aggressive. But that really doesn't happen very often, actually rarely. But there is a possibility. There isn't a contraindication with my experience. I'm not speaking for Zoetis. i got to separate myself here. Uh, in my experience, I do not have any concerns about using Cilio in animal who is aggressive because he's scared of noises in particular. Now, the owner may not be able to get that. If her dog's aggressive toward her and you prescribe something where she's got to get all up on top of him and get in his mouth, that's not very good medicine. So we have to think about the risk to the owner, not just the medication choice, if that makes sense. Right. Um, I think that there was a little confusion. There are three questions here versions of saying that <clears throat> that seem to think that you said that Cilio should not be used when combined with other drugs, which I don't believe is what you said. Could you clarify? Huh. So the question that we're discussing is uh, whether or not you can use Cilio with other medications. Yes, we use Cilio with all kinds of other medications. Don't combine it with clonidine or with acepromazine because of the risk of hypotension. Lots of people combine them. I feel like I have a ton of choices that don't interact on any level, and so I just don't combine cilia with acepromazine or clonidine. But I combine it with everything else. Great. Well, thank you. This, is, this has been great supplemental information. We appreciate you taking the extra time.